Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of The Farming Programme. Uh, at the end of a week when the weather, as I usually say at this time on a Sunday morning, um, the weather really has changed. I remember telling you last week that it was the finest September and the finest harvest spell that I think I ever remember. Um, but that has rapidly changed and it would seem that autumn has caught up with us. And I remember my finger stinging one morning for the first time this autumn uh, when we were getting the cows in, uh, when we opened the gate uh, and we realised that yes, it had changed and the rain shortly followed. Uh, and we've had quite a bit of rain this, this past week, though it has to be said, not as much as many of our counterparts have had in the UK. It's changed our thinking now, and uh, already cows being fed silage, um, we're thinking now about perhaps it's time they had a bit of shelter at nights, and we might be thinking about bringing them into the cubicle house, or at least giving, the, giving them the option uh, as to whether they lie in or lie out. Consequently, milk has dropped off a bit, at least ours has, with the colder weather, and probably we haven't got the supplemented feeding quite up to standard yet, uh, but we'll be working on that. Um, again, we've been busy. Uh, uh, over these last few days, we've been starting to flush the ewes, uh, we've been busy trimming feet and one thing or another, generally preparing them, as we do at this time of the year, for the mating season. Uh, you may remember last week's programme when we brought you the second half of uh, two programmes on the dairy industry, highlighting some of the problems that uh, we're facing there, those of us who are producing milk at least. And today we've changed and we've gone to another sector of agriculture. I'm not saying it's any easier in this particular sector. Uh, there are still problems here, um, but perhaps they are not quite as immediate or, or as obvious as they are in the milk sector. Uh, today we're talking about uh, suckler beef uh, and the beef industry. And joining me in the studio is Eddie Teer, um, who is the senior manager of Isle of Man Bank. Eddie, of course, as farmers all know, um, has an agricultural background. I can trace him back as far as Balnahow and Santon. He says that's as far back as it goes. But um, I, I have known Eddie for some time, and I know he has a good knowledge of the island's farming industry. Eddie, has that been a help for you in your career as a bank manager? Gianna, um, I think I've been very lucky because coming from an agricultural background, um, I've at least had the first couple of steps on the ladder. Um, the thing that I have realised over the last 10 years especially is that the agricultural industry itself is becoming far more professional and also too much more specialised. The days of the general farmer, when, you, when you'd have um, a farmer, a few potatoes, beef, milk and sheep, uh, are very much in the minority now. Uh, you've got bigger dairy outfits, um, bigger beef outfits as well, and of course extensive flocks of sheep. Now, Eddie, now listeners will be wondering why, uh, since we're going to talk about suckler beef, I'm talking to Eddie Tia, the manager of Isle of Man Bank. But Eddie, uh, it's been your practice in the bank to bring somebody over to talk to Manx farmers. I think each year you do it almost annually, don't you, uh, when you bring people over to, to talk on a specialised subject? Yes, we've done this now for the last five or six years, and we've been very fortunate with the choice of speakers we've had over and really Duncan Puller is no exception. You know, he's absolutely first class and I've been impressed with him over, over the last two days that he's been on the Isle of Man. Um, I try to rotate the sector and the topic each year. Last year unfortunately because of the foot and mouth restrictions I had to take a rain check on it but I didn't want people to think that we'd completely forgotten so here we are. We're <laughs> certainly back again. Just before we leave you and your position in the bank, Eddie, it's, um, it's just been announced, I believe, that you're about to retire. The official announcement is just about to go out, but yes, uh, as, I suppose you could say that you heard it first on Manx Radio. <laughs> but uh, I had been talking about my future at the bank for quite some time uh, because I'm no spring chicken, but nevertheless, I do enjoy the work and uh, the job's been very good to me. But um, I did hear uh, very recently that um, I, I would be retiring at the end of the year. Um, I hasten to add that I'm not 60 and I'm not coming up to 60 we either. We never have guessed. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nevertheless, that's it. And after the initial shock, um, I picked myself up, dusted myself down. I thought to myself, well, at least it gives me a chance to have a look at something else. And Eddie, say something about your successor who is sitting with us here in the studio this afternoon. Well, I've got... Um, my colleague Robert Lockwood. Uh, Robert has been working with me for the last couple of years. Um, I have to say I've been impressed with him. 
he's um, one of these guys who's quietly understated, I think is the best way of putting it. Uh, he looks as if he's laid back, but underneath it all, um, there's a couple of feet working furiously. <laughs> so, uh, no, um, he's... He has already got agricultural customers on his portfolio. He's been working with me for a couple of years. And the other side of the coin is um, that he's my choice as well. Oh, well, then. Robert, if I could turn to you then, are you looking forward to your new role then in, in, in banking? Yes, very much so. Um, as he said, I've been uh, working with him for a couple of years now um, on both the property and, and other sectors that Eddie deals with. Um, my involvement with the farming industry in the past has largely been on the producer side, um, whereas Eddie's spread covers the uh, the associations and uh, the creamery and the, the meat plant as well. Um, we've recently met with him and, and Eddie has done the introductions to me and it's an area now I'm looking forward to taking up. So have you been out on Manx Farms? Has that been, has that been part of your, your um, remit in the past? Yes, yes. I've uh, been in customer-facing role for oh, about seven or eight years now. And amongst my customers, is that, yeah. is that the in phrase "customer facing role"? Uh, <laughs> farmers won't, farmers won't recognise that, you know. They'll only know they'll only know a posh car about driving on the yard. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. that's what you call it. Yeah. Well, John, I bought him a present yesterday, a pair of black wellies. So yeah. he's all right. We we certainly couldn't have him go around in a pair of green wellies. Oh, certainly not, yeah. and certainly not the ones with the buckles at the top. <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, Robert, we wish you well in uh, in your in your new job, uh, and look forward to meeting you much more than in in agricultural circles uh, as you pursue your career in the bank. Yes, thank you. I'm looking forward to it. Then, if we could turn to uh, the man that uh, Eddie has brought over uh, to talk to Manx farmers about succulent beef production, Duncan Puller. Duncan, tell us a bit about yourself. It's always best if it comes from you instead of me trying to guess what you may have been. Tell us what what, what your job is and and uh, and why you are qualified to come and speak to us. Ooh, well, that's a bit of a challenge to start with. Um, I, I work for the Meat and Livestock Commission in uh, Great Britain, so we cover um, Scotland, England and Wales, and my uh, job at the moment is as beef and sheep scientist. And there's, I guess, three parts to that, uh, which is, the first part is, is talking to the meat industry, farmers, producers, the abattoir, to, to look at the problems that they have and see if there are any research solutions to those problems. Then it's commissioning the research to actually try and develop uh, the whole process to get to get new ways of doing things and then the th the final third is actually going out and telling people about the results and trying to find ways of helping them implement the the new findings in a way that's going to help their business so you've told us what your job is and, and and what your remit is where do you come from what's your background i'm 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 again like um eddie from farming stock um i grew up on a dairy farm in kent um, but of Scottish parentage um, and we had mainly a dairy but it was also a mixed farm with beef and sheep um, and then when I went to college I did a degree at Nottingham uh, in agriculture and then followed that on with a PhD at Reading um, and as my dad pointed out at the time I was still at school when I was 23 which wasn't very good so <laughs> but uh, since then I've uh... a farmer would make that comment <laughs> wouldn't he but um, <laughs> The way the farm worked out, um, um, that got sold before I was sort of ready to go back. And uh, uh, so I went to work for ADAS, the uh, consultancy service, for 10 years and then uh, four years ago moved on to the MLC. Now, in agriculture at this point in time, ever since the onset of BSE, followed by foot and mouth and all the other problems, um, has has your role been highlighted then? Uh, are we in a period of, of radical change now and are your services desperately needed? Uh, well, I'd like to think so anyway, mm. but uh, I think we are. It's certainly those areas that have been affected by foot and mouth, I, I, I've come to the conclusion that we're, we're sort of condensing perhaps 10 years of evolution in the way people are changing their farming into perhaps two or three years so that uh, for example, a, a suckler producer who, who was maybe not very happy with the kind of um, cattle he was using and wanted to change to something else. So very unfortunate for those that were uh, culled out, but they, they're then given a kind of a blank sheet of paper to rewrite how they want to run their business. And quite a few of them are making uh, interesting decisions about how, how they want to breed cows and, and run suckler herds. Are you saying then, out, out of the out of the trauma of, of foot and mouth particularly, that, that some opportunities are beginning to emerge for some people? Yes, I think that's true. I mean, obviously, it's, it's very distressing at the time for those that are involved. 
But I think those that have had now time to consider what they want to do and how they want to do it, they are setting out with, with renewed vigour and, and, and fresh ideas about how to, to run their businesses. Is, is that true in, in most cases of people who are affected by foot and mouth? I, I guess I couldn't really judge. I mean, you, you have some who, whose decision may be, well, I'm going to stop. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm near to retiring age and, and I've got a nice uh, bank balance now, thank you very much, and it's time to stop. And then you've got those that wish to carry on as they were before, and certainly there are some of those who are desperate to get back in. And then there are, there are a significant number who are, who are just taking a little time to think about how they want, want to do whatever it is they want to do and, and changing direction as a result. Now, I heard it said fairly recently that um, someone observing what was going on in agriculture uh, was surprised, very surprised, in fact, to find so many farmers going back into particularly into the dairy industry, and this was, uh, I think, in the north of England, Cumbria particularly, they were surprised to find farmers going back in. Uh, are you surprised uh, that the people want to keep going and are determined to keep going? Um, not really, no, because I think for, for many people, it, 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 you know, it, it's part of their whole life and, and they, they can't kick the habit. <laughs> uh, they need to be, uh, find some other stimulus to, to stop them uh, uh, farming. So I, I'm not surprised. But, I mean, the thing that I find refreshing is, is that, many people and and i've been to several farmer meetings organized in the wake of foot and mouth in in the difficult areas are, are saying right now now's the time to feed us new information and new ideas because we've got the opportunity to to implement them because one of the things as a a researcher come technology transfer type of role that i find is you can have a really good idea and you can put it to the farmer and he can say yep i can see that that you you know i ought to change the way i'm breeding my cows but I've got a hundred of these here and it's going to take me 10 years to, to change over and, and the financial risk of setting out on something new is actually uh, too threatening so I'm going to have to take it cautiously uh, which you know can be frustrating when you can already understand as the researcher and promoter of that that you want it to happen but then again as I said at the beginning from the farmer's point of view you've got to understand that he's got a business to manage and, and the risks to assess and, and it isn't likely to charge out on something just because you tell him it's a good idea it's got to be worked into the business as a whole are you able to be quite objective in this then or do you find yourself um, encouraging uh, farmers to to sort of go into to change and go into this role can can you perhaps as a researcher um taking the wider picture than a farmer may do uh, when he's at home on his own farm can can you see a future for him and, and say yes this this is worth pursuing Yes, I, I guess I view my, my role as, as, as not really as a consultant prescribing what to do. The, the job I do, I'm, I'm more interested in, in making people think about the issues from the, for themselves. So f as an example, um, we, you know, I've come to the island to talk about suckler cows. Um, at some levels, on, with, with a group of people, my first challenge would be, you know, where do you think the whole business is going? Is there going to be a suckler industry uh, in the UK and, and what size it's going to be and, and what are the markets going to be? And, and then bring that all the way down to you as an individual and say, well, and where do you think you fit in all this? So let's start at that point then. Um, is, is, there, is there, do you believe that, that there is going to be a market? Are, are British people going to eat beef? Absolutely, yep. I mean, British population are very robust beef eaters. It takes them an awful, an awful lot to put them off. And, and a good example of that is uh, the BSE effect. And, and post-1996, yes, there was a dip away in beef consumption. But just now, the latest figures that we've got for the, for the country show that, in fact, we're eating more beef than we were before 1996. So the total volume of consumption is, is higher than ever. Do, so, do you believe that, then, that, that eating habits haven't, haven't changed a great deal? Uh, or are they changing, but just using beef perhaps in, in uh, another way? Yeah, I, th I think the latter's true there, yeah. Um, eating habits are, are changing, and, and MLC spends a lot of time and effort researching what consumers want to do and how they want to do it. And, and certainly there is a continuing move towards what they call convenience foods and shorter preparation times. So if you, if you look at those numbers, then most people expect to come home from work and have a meal on the table inside 15 minutes, which is very different from 20 or 30 years ago when, when it was much longer. What about the difference in consumption between, say, uh, hindquarter beef and forequarter beef, then? Is, can you identify two, two areas in that? Yeah. Because forequarter beef used to be, or maybe it is still, uh, difficult to, to sort of uh, use. Yes. Well, I mean, following on that example, yes, I mean, things that are, um, use minced beef, burgers or, or ready meals 
fit that convenience mode. And then a roast joint, um, and, and surprisingly, steaks as well, although they're relatively quick to, to cook, um, are consigned to a more leisurely period for eating. So yes, there is much more of a shift towards processing the beef in a further way before it's consumed. And so your traditional stews, although that would use four quarter um, roasts and steaks, are, are becoming a smaller and more discreet market in the home. But then eating out, they still have a good strong position because you can go to a restaurant and have a steak or go to a carvery uh, and there's a good market there. And, and that sort of final point extends that, that certainly we're eating more of our meals out of the home, which changes the kind of beef that people want to use. There's another change overtaking us as well, isn't there, as uh, more countries are admitted to the EU um, and we're, we're likely to see a lot more produce from those countries and from other continental uh, countries coming into Britain. Mm. Do you think the British housewife is discerning enough to, to want to eat beef that's produced in the British Isles as opposed to beef produced perhaps in Poland uh, or Czechoslovakia or Germany or whatever? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the evidence that we have to date from, from consumer research says that that most people um, speak patri patriotically and would say that they would prefer to buy uh, British, but when they get to the to the filling their supermarket trolley or whatever, um, they are not standing up to their word and they will will take the bargain or take what's on offer and not look too closely at the country of origin label. So. I guess to answer your direct question, I don't think they will discern. But um, we're being told that farm assured is becoming more and more important, that people want to know the background from from where their food is produced. Is that not going to be important? I, I think it is for a certain section of, of society. And, and though there are there is a group, but I, I mean, sadly, perhaps it is a, quite a small group that think that intensely about their food sources and I know in the farming community which is where I operate like you um, we are very concerned and we're very interested and we that go will into surprise. shops that will surprise many <laughs> listeners to hear you say yeah, um, I, that, that I, farm I, assured is I, not as important as some people well, would have us believe I didn't say it's not important but it, it's not important to the consumer the consumer so who's, who's it important to it's important to the retailer it, Why? Gives, it gives them the assurance they're looking for about their supply hmm. and, and, and how many um, assurance issues are actually faced off to the consumer on a label or in the stand and, and I would say you find it very hard to find anyway perhaps freedom foods that the RSPCA is one but Fabel on the and uh, uh, the squabbler you, in the UK you wouldn't see on labels in shops that doesn't mean it's not important but it isn't a consumer issue directly do you think then uh, from what you're saying it would seem to me that we've got um, a, a, a a, a remarkable marketing job to do if we're going to sell against imported beef and we do have the edge if it's if it's home produced surely yeah, I think so I mean uh, but uh, <laughs> against that you've got uh, you know a big economic uh, environment in which to play and and just now GB wide we're looking at 40% of imports for beef supply 60% home produced and 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 in that environment you've also got people disposing of Holstein bull calves from dairy herds without giving them a chance to get into the beef supply chain. And, and until we can change the economic environment that farmers are asked to operate in that would make, well, you as a dairy farmer, uh, do something different with those calves other than dispose of them very early, then you can't address the supply. So yes, Britishness is good, but if we're only 60% of the total supply, then what we need to do is, is manage the environment to allow us to encourage more people to produce a bigger chunk of, of um, that demand that already exists, which, as I said at, right at the beginning, you know, is, is robust and unlikely to go down. So if that's the background to the, to the meat industry then and, and its, its requirements, what about on the ground then? You've come to the Isle of Man and uh, you've had a chance. Uh, this is being recorded. What day is it? Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're recording this on Wednesday afternoon. You, you've had a chance to look around the Isle of Man in a very short time under the guidance of, of Eddie Tier. Uh, what what, what do you, are your impressions of, of the, what you've seen here? Yeah, well, we, we've concentrated on, on suckler producers. And, and what I see actually is, is very similar issues facing the suckler producers here as, as we get in uh, GB. And, and, and the single biggest concern I guess we've come across uh, would be how do I produce the right sort of suckler cow? Uh, I'm, I'm not happy, uh, you might not like this as a dairy farmer, but I'm not happy with these Holstein crosses. They're not, they're not 
giving me what I want in a suckler cow. So should I grade up to purebred Limousin or Charolais or something, or should I um, try a different approach? And those pressures are also addressed uh, by a lot of our suckler producers uh, in GB. And what are you telling them? Well, I'm, I'm telling them that, that where there is not a premium market for having a purebred suckler system, don't do it, because there's uh, in crossbred cows, if you make your main cow herd crossbred, you, there are serious advantages to be had in terms of what they call hybrid vigour, and that is the extra weight of weaned calf that you get simply by having a crossbred cow, because it affects things like fertility um, and to a smaller extent the growth rate in the calf and to give you an example compared with purebred breeding if you have a crossbred cow you can get up to 20 percent extra weight of weaned calf per cow served so it, it's it's a really big production bonus that that you forego if you go down a, a purebred route and there's no price premium at the end have you been aware, made aware though of, of the how the support system works in the island that we do have a quality based support system yes uh, and and that is is extremely important in the very subject that you're addressing at the present time namely the, the quality of the nurse cow we've got to have the, the right shaped beast uh, yep. to, to gain the support yes well i mean in in the example i've just said if if you're moving away from a dairy crossbred into a three-quarter or seven-eighths or even all beef but perhaps a mixture of beef then the chances are you're going to actually improve the confirmation score which would move the carcasses into a better area of your of your payment grid ha so have we in fact got this right in the isle of man <laughs> that, that our support is is quality based is, is is that the right way to do it well i yes quality is important because it affects uh, yield and and can knock on in, to some extent into eating quality but but alongside that and in my view of equal importance would be consistency and and I again looking at your payment grids which I've had a, a, a thorough briefing on um, the fact that your weight band targets are, are fairly tight is extremely encouraging because um, we know that the way all retailers are operating operating and, and you've got some of the major players here as well um, the weight specification and the fat cover as well as the confirmation score are very important to them putting what they want on the shelf so I think the pricing grid is actually very astutely put together and, and mm. should uh, ask polite way of saying it or perhaps force uh, producers to try and um, hit the right target well, nothing will uh, encourage a producer to hit the right target than the financial return. Indeed, that's that's yeah. that's the one that, that will always do it. Um, now, if we if we move on along the you've been on the Manx farms. Mm -hmm. Any similarities then um, on on the sort of the Manx systems? To you'll, you'll obviously we're much smaller scale here in the Isle of Man, um, but do you detect any other similarities? Any other similar concerns? Yeah, I, I think the major issues are in terms of what you do to produce the right sort of carcasses or, or animals to make the carcasses so, so we're concerned are, are, are the same. Yeah, we're concerned yeah. mainly with breeds at the moment then, aren't we? And, and uh, as we look forward, what, what, what type of cow we're going to use? Yeah, and I, I, th I would extend it out from breeds as well. It's also about size. Um, have you got the right size of cow with the right qualities to operate off your farm resources? So if you're higher up the hill and you've got shorter or poorer grazing, um, you probably best, well, you, in my view, you're better off with a, a smaller sort of cow that can look after itself. Have you been surprised at, at the contrasts in, in Manx farming situations? I mean, it, we're said to be an island of contrasts, and that's never more true than it is of our, of our landscape, yes. uh, where you uh, may have a, a lot of land, thousands of acres, of the one type at the one altitude. Here it goes up and down yes. very quickly. Yes. Well, on, on, on the first two visits that, that Eddie took me to, we, we were um, quite close to the top of uh, the fell at one point point at um, 1300 meters and the, and the next farm we went to was on the sandy lands at, in the north of the island and I was told that the difference in rainfall was probably threefold from 23 to, to 60 odd inches yes um, so and that's over the space of I don't know 20 miles or so and you you've had a chance to look at the meat plant as well yes we had a look around that this morning yeah um, we're quite proud of that should we be yeah, I mean, I, th I think you should be, yes. I think the, the opportunities that having this sort of isolated market to work in, although, uh, you know, we, d we did talk about the export opportunities as well, means that, that you have a very good um, chance to work together with the meat plant and the producers um, working towards the same goals. And, and certainly the way 
the discussions have gone with with the people I've met, I I think here you've actually got a better group um, with some real synergy and working together than you have in many situations in in the UK where the free market means there's much more toing and froing between um, abattoirs and suppliers will will chop and change, and it it actually impedes development, whereas here um, there's much, in my view anyway, from what I've seen, there's much more of a pulling together kind of approach and, and that's really quite rewarding to see that. Now a few hours is no good to get to know the Isle of Man, you can't possibly do that, <laughs> but, and there's all sorts of things that I wonder you know, if, if you've sort of uh, caught up with. When you talk about um, where we market our, our meat, um, a, a lot of our produce is exported simply because we have to have uh, enough production to justify a, a creamery and a meat plant like that. So we're into the export market quite heavily. And uh, and that is very, very important to us. Uh, and, and that's why I think you'll find that our pricing grid is so tight that buyers buy on on spec mm. uh, and and we have to meet that and uh, but uh, the abattoir of course is was built to uh, as you will probably have observed to EC standards uh, mm. which enables us to export so where's the future then um, what what you're going to talk to Manx farmers in a meeting later this evening um, what sort of things are you going to be saying to them are you going to have an encouraging message message for them yes I think so um, I, I think Certainly in the beef production sector, we know there's a very strong demand there. And, and if we can get the supply side right in terms of getting even more into specification uh, by looking after the breeding and the feeding management, then th there is a, a really good opportunity for the, the quality product to be taken through and, and sold to consumers that are going to appreciate what they get. Are we, are we, have we got a lot of changes to make? I think... I think Evolution has to carry on, yeah, developments have to happen and, and, and those that, that move fastest in, in these times and take on the right developments are the ones who are going to um, survive and prosper. So, so keep an open mind to these developments, I think. Will you be saying something about the breeds we should be using or that we might think about using uh, in the future when you talk to the farmers? Yep, I mean, it, I, I try not to be too um, uh, breedist about it and, and sway one way or the other. I, my main message is... is, is get the right ones for you in your situation and there isn't um, a catch-all which says this breed will do the best everywhere. It is a question of horses for courses because if you're at the top of the hill or as opposed to down on, on the lowlands then you do need a different type of animal and you won't get that from one breed. So I'm not fudging it but there are pigeonholes for each type. Eddie, Tia, if I can come back to you, you've known the Manx farming situation for many, many years now and you've heard what Duncan's been saying. How receptive do you think the Manx farmer will be at this point in time to, to what, what Duncan is suggesting? Well, I've never met a closed mind on the farm yet. They, they are prepared to rise to the challenges and over the years they have looked seriously at their costs and tried to get the costs down and they've been very successful. So they produce a quality product um, which uh, will stand its place really in any international market, never mind a domestic market in the Isle of Man. Are you confident that there is a future, that uh, we can go forward with confidence, carefully taking on such advice as, as Duncan is offering and, uh, and, and being open-minded about things? I, th I think there is a future. Um, I don't think we're ever going to get back to the halcyon days after the Second World War. But nevertheless, yes, there is a future for go-ahead and progressive farmers. And Robert, does, uh, you've sat and observed all that's going on here. Um, does, does what we've been talking about, does that encourage you or does it rather frighten you about what, what might be the, the, um, the climate out there as you venture out in your black wellies yeah. to talk to the farmers? <laughs> <laughs> well, as I said, I mean, I have, I'm, I'm not a stranger to farming customers, um, so I, mean, I, I do appreciate what they have been going through. Um, it's been very interesting um, going around with Eddie and Duncan around the farms and I have to admit, I mean, his ideas have been very well received by the, the farmers that we've been to see. Um, as Eddie said, they do have very open minds um, and I think guidance from an expert like Duncan, I think, uh, is very welcome. Well, there we must leave it, gentlemen, because we've come to the end of our time. But if I could say uh, thank you to Robert Lockwood for, for coming here and the, likely to be the man that we may be talking to in the yeah. future, though I think Eddie's going to continue <laughs> in maybe a sort of a PR role. Um, uh, to you, Eddie, for bringing uh, uh, Duncan uh, Pollard to us. Uh, 
thank you very much for joining us and to you Duncan for sharing your very very much wider experience than we uh, have available to us here on the Isle of Man we're always grateful for somebody coming to to show us the wider picture and ways in which we might go forward gentlemen one and all thank you very much indeed thank you you're welcome thank you well there we are ladies and gentlemen there we must leave it for this week and this is John Kenyuk signing off until next week's programme